On June 2nd and 3rd, 2011, the Center for Design and Geopolitics held its first annual conference in La Jolla at CalIT2, the California Institute of Telecommunications and Information Technology, on the campus of the University of California at San Diego. Well, it's my pleasure to welcome you to Atkinson Hall. Uh, I think some of you have been here before, but for the benefit of the visitors who haven't, uh, this is uh, the home of the San Diego Division of the California Institute for Telecommunications and Information Technology. Uh, we are in our 11th year, and uh, wonder wonders, the campus has allowed us to continue to live out of the box, so to say. Uh, we uniquely attempt to combine technology areas uh, with uh, societal thrusts, uh, where you know, technology can play a useful role. Uh, the four technology elements that have served as uh, the foundations for Cal IT2 from when we won this uh, award back in the year 2000 are basically nanotechnology, wireless and optical communications, as well as what we call cyber infrastructure. Uh, there's a lot of history on campus, uh, in, especially in engineering, that we were leveraging in picking on uh, these four technology thrust areas as well as industry clusters. So if you're familiar with the San Diego area, it'll come as no surprise to you that we are, have been playing a significant role in the development of the wireless cluster here. But what is perhaps most unique about Cal ID2 is looking beyond the technology foundations at application thrusts. Uh, we are in the process of finishing up our path forward and the four application areas that we've selected, which I think you will hear echoes of in the discussions that you'll be having today, uh, include energy, uh, environment, health, and culture. So uh, the technology areas and these application thrusts uh, have a certain universality to them. What's unique about what we do is how we connect them, how we bring together people that uh, are already here, that are attracted to the new possibilities that emerge when you put it all together. And I'm personally looking forward to participating in today's conversations and discussions as much as possible. Uh, to get some sense of the conceptual space in which one can be creative as we go about uh, making a difference. So, welcome to Cal IT2. Thank you, Ramesh. Um, so this morning's panel is um, on planetary data and planetary governance and how it is or is not <clears throat> possible to think about the uh, the instrumentalization as a planet as the basis of a of a particular kind of governmental platform. I was reading online last night um, about how Liberia is putting, uh, which has a big problem with pirate logging, people cutting down trees and taking them wood where it's not supposed to be going, putting barcodes. The plan is to put barcodes in each of the trees they have in these areas of the forest so that when things when the trees are cut down that at some point in time they can actually verify where things are going with this as well. And I was talking with a friend of mine about how um, at some point perhaps in the near future after the, is the, the next step after barcoding the trees would be tagging every little part of the tree, the leaf and sort of as well. You know, you think about IPv6, 10 to the 23 addresses per person, you sort of divide this up, and, you know, you can imagine every leaf having an IP address in the particular, you know. It's called DNA, that's right, yes, thank you, right. Yeah. Um, now, um, historically governance has assumed the shape of whatever information technology it can use to describe and organize the spaces over which it claims sovereignty. And while cyber infrastructure, sort of a nice catch-all term, and envelopes or attempts to envelope an entire planet and to turn the globe into a kind of instrument of self-quantification, today those technologies already supersede and subsede, if we can coin the phrase, national boundaries. And in doing so, they produce new forms of territory as well in their image, as well as distorting those that they have inherited. The challenge then of managing a planet now represented in, as a single domain with a granularity heretofore impossible is one of the key challenges posed to cyber infrastructural design. But as ever, the sheer quantity of data in no way guarantees governability. And this is particularly true of what we might call ecological governance or governance of the spaces that include and exclude the human. 
uh, the reality described by this over this proliferation of data is one that is equally overwhelmed by ideological obfuscation. More importantly, I think, is that the, the politics of data, we could call it, it, requires the design of forms of production, forms of storage, semantics, distribution, surveillance, and structure that exceed what is possible through the energies of sheer quantification. So for all of the wonderful things that we can think and say and do regarding the instrumentalization of a planet, generating exabytes of data about it, and uh, this, can, this can accelerate and decelerate, uh, realize and impede what we may recognize as some kind of enlightenment. But the real issue then is how information is, again, never separate from ideological formation. If we believe that in some way planetary data can provide the basis of cosmopolitan mechanisms of governance, then we have to be not only clear about how bad actors or simply weird actors don't just distort an otherwise clean system, they in fact constitute it. And those motivations and those politics are what any kind of cosmopolitanism information may in fact presume to be. Yesterday there was a few speakers, including myself, who talked about um, the reappearance of medieval and feudal political forms and the way in which cyber infrastructure, cloud platforms, and so forth um, may not only not inoculate us to the reappearance of these kinds of neo-medieval forms, may be the key platform that allows for their reemergence. And if I think we meant this in a, a pejorative sense. I was also seeing how uh, at the same episode, episode of Web Surfing last night noticed, noted that <clears throat> Jim Hansen, NASA climate scientist with which we're all familiar, um, um, has in, initiated a project in which he's invoking the public trust doctrine in a lawsuit against the U.S. government, several of his agencies, the EPA, Department of Energy, and Department of Commerce, which is a legal statute, of course, from the 6th century and the, and the, um, uh, the time of the Byzantine Empire, uh, Justinian, in this way. All of which is to say is this is, uh, the, the, ambiv the ambivalence runs deep. So, our first speaker is Larry Smarr. Larry Smarr, as many of you know, is the founder and director of Cal IT2, um, and someone who is really, as well as Lev, more responsible than anyone for my, for my being here. He holds the Gruber Professorship in Computer Science uh, here in the Jacobs School. Um, he, has been and he has been and continues to be one of the major uh, driving figures in the development of information infrastructure, including the early and, uh, and contemporary history of the internet, web, scientific visualization, virtual reality, and global telepresence. For 15 years, he was the, the founding director of the NCSA, the National Center for Supercomputing Applications in Illinois, which I'll say a little more about in a moment. He served as the principal investigator of the NSF's Optiputer Project and is currently the PI on the Moore Foundation's Camera Project, as well as the, the co-PI in the NSF's Project Greenlight. Larry was also um, one of the, uh, the founder of, a, of the field of numerical general relativity and made major contributions to computational high energy astrophysics, and study of supernova, neutron stars, black holes, relativistic magnetohydrodynamics, galactic jet dynamics, that sort of thing. While at Illinois, um, Larry wrote a ambitious proposal. I'm just taking this straight from the Wikipedia entry because it's I can't, couldn't say it any better. This is still, I find, a totally remarkable uh, uh, accomplishment. Um, wrote an ambitious proposal to address the future needs of scientific research. Seven other University of Illinois professors joined as co-PIs, and many others provided descriptions that would be accomplished and so forth. So, so forth. A, for, a proposal formally entitled A Center for Scientific Engineering Supercomputing that it became known as the Black Proposal after the cover of its book. It was submitted to the NSF in 1983, a scant 10 pages long. It was the first unsolicited proposal and accepted and approved by the NSF, and it resulted in the charter of four supercomputing centers at Cornell, Illinois, Princeton, and San Diego, right across the street here, and a fifth at Pittsburgh added later. In 1985, Smarr became the first director of that center, the NCSA. The NCSA was also, of course, the birthplace of Mosaic, the web browser. So, it's my real pleasure to introduce Larry Smart. Thank you. This conference has been eight years in the planning. 
although at the time we didn't know that. Um, Lev and I, back when Cal-82 was triple wide trailers, um, envisioned the notion of getting some of the world's leading thinkers of critical uh, inquiry in art, architecture, literature, and so forth um, to gradually come together. And we nucleated it with Lev and uh, Jordan, Ricardo, others that we uh, gradually recruited here, and, and then Benjamin. And then they've put this center together and then ask all of you to come. And so I couldn't be more thrilled uh, as uh, seeing the culmination of this long-term vision that we had, because Cal IT2, I felt, had to have your kind of over-the-horizon radar uh, to really effectively live in the future, which is what our day job is. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to try to give you in the next 15 or 20 minutes <clears throat> the results of having spent a frustrating uh, three or four decades in the field of climate change. Uh, I'm not a climate change scientist myself. Uh, I am a person who enables the uh, field. I've worked closely with NASA over the years, National Academy. In fact, I'm on a National Academy panel right now looking at the next 20 years of climate simulation. Um, and I just want to share with you some facts and how I've come to realize that science and scientific explanation is not going to be enough to deal with this problem. So here is from uh, core samples uh, of ice, uh, the fluctuations in the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere for the last 800,000 years. Each of those ups and downs is a separate ice age. And there's a fascinating book that I recommend to everybody called Homo Britannicus, which uses the um, uh, paleontology and uh, archaeology uh, evidence of showing that as each ice age came, uh, it swept off all humans uh, by the advancing ice sheets across England. Uh, and then, <clears throat> uh, in fact, uh, as, it, uh, as the water had been sucked up, you could walk to France because the sea level had fallen so much. Then, it melted and the sea level rose. There was a re-population. Uh, and this was multiple species of humans. So my point to you is that the entire history, not just of Homo sapiens, but going back to Homo erectus, Neanderthal, has been adapting to a constantly changing climate. Now, where are we today? Well, we're at the blue dot in terms of increasing through human action the CO2 concentration. And CO2 is only about half of the gases. Charlie Kennel will talk a little bit later about the others. And if you project forward with the economic growth with the fact we're going to add two full China's worth of population that aren't born yet before 2050 to the Earth population, and that for the first time in history, vast numbers of humans are coming out of poverty uh, largely because of the addition of energy, which is based on fossil fuels. 80% of electricity generated in China is coal. Uh, and that's adding the CO2 to the air. Well, compared to, if you think about ice ages and the impact that they've had, think of you know, ice as high as the top of the, of the John Hancock building in Chicago, over Chicago, uh, to it being 110 degrees in the summer. That climate variation was driven by this small variation in CO2. Humans have now driven it to ways that actually we haven't seen since the Pliocene three to five million years ago. And as The Economist said this last week, welcome to the Anthropocene. It's a new era. It's a new planet, as uh, uh, Bill McKibben says, uh, calls it Earth. It's a new world that humans have not seen before that we're creating. And if you look at, uh, you'd think, well, OK, um, although there's obviously controversy out there, so-called deniers and so forth, um, surely we know enough to um, figure to pull back on the, on the throttle of emissions. Well, this is uh, through 2009. And you can see that the US started this 
Uh, along with the UK for the last 200 years, we've been filling up the atmosphere with CO2, and now China, with its industrialization, has shot ahead of us. Um, <clears throat> it looks there in 2009 like things are coming down. That's the uh, international financial collapse in the US. But the International Energy Agency has uh, just uh, last month concluded from its measurements that the CO2 emissions are now higher than ever in history, in spite of our scientific knowledge. Uh, if I uh, just uh, was at the Future and Review conference in um, Los Angeles last week, and I introduced uh, um, one of the major oceanographic researchers, Professor of Oceanography, Vislav uh, Malosky, uh, Malosky uh, who's at the Naval Postgraduate School. This is an image from satellite, and you can see that the ice on the Arctic has melted so much in the summer that there's now two shipping channels open for the first time. Uh, and here are his calculations of the volume of Arctic ice, this being zero, this being from 1980 through 2000, and his projection is that because of the warm currents coming in under it, not just the sun melting from above, that the Arctic will become ice-free perhaps this decade. The IPCC was saying it'd be more like 2030, 2040, 2050. So this is accelerating. So we see this, right? And so surely people, when they have understood scientifically that there is a clear and present danger to their future, would change their behavior. That's, I think, the assumption we all work on. So I thought, well, let's go get some data on what humans are actually like. What do they do? And I want to pick two. Um, they happen to be the two leading causes of preventable death in the United States, uh, tobacco smoking and uh, obesity. Uh, I'm not here to say either of these are a bad thing. Uh, probably some of you do one of each, uh, one or the other. Uh, certain a lot of folks do, but let's just look at how humans react to these clear dangers. Now take smoking. In 1964, the Surgeon General's report came out and first identified clearly the relationship between smoking and future damage to your health. Since then, in the 50 years, there have been 30 more of these Surgeon General reports, culminating with one just six months ago. The evidence that, uh, scientific evidence, that uh, cigarette consumption and follows, uh, is followed by lung cancer increased in, in, in consumption of cigarettes led to an increase in lung cancer has been clear for a very long time. And yet, there are over 400,000 deaths a year. Um, and many of you know people who have died. These are pretty horrible deaths, actually, and not just the last death, but the leading up to it for years in many cases. And in fact, there are over 8 million uh, that live in the US uh, with serious illnesses caused by smoking, in spite of the scientific knowledge. So what has the world done going from this global data to global politics. Well, this is, I love this metric here. Where these are piles of um, billions of cigarettes that have con been consumed. Here's 1960, Surgeon General's report. Here's today, tripled consumption globally. And the World Health Organization has shown that by 2030, <coughs> there will be 8 million deaths per year, that's 16 times the current number of people that die in the U.S. from tobacco. So this is the, this is the way that humans on our planet react in the face of at least one set of scientific facts. And what you can see here is just like the uh, case we saw with global warming, the United States for 400 years has led in tobacco and is exporting but now China is the place where the largest uptake is happening. Well, let's switch to obesity. Back in 1985, it's hard to believe, uh, this is the map of the states, uh, how little there was. Uh, down below, you see the light blue is less than 10% of the population uh, is uh, overweight or obese. That's a BMI greater than 30. Uh, and a few are dark blue, which means they're 10 to 15%. Most of them were below 10 percent. This is 2009. This is 
down in the south now, over 30% of the population is uh, obese or overweight, uh, and most of the central region uh, is uh, in 25 to 30%. And if you look at the United States, this is the percentage of adult population. The, the largest is here. China is coming up. And if you say, well, let's just look at the caloric intake. This is greater than 3,400 calories a day. And you can see a pretty strong correlation. <laughs> and there's a lot of other scientific evidence that not just calories, but high fructose corn syrup in particular, um, which has been shown uh, just uh, literally, I tweeted this study yesterday uh, by Princeton uh, to lead to much more weight gain than normal sugar. And because of uh, the government subsidies of corn uh, driving the price of high fructose corn syrup below that of sugar, uh, it became a substitute. It's almost in all preferred foods that we eat. The um, average American has gone from uh, something like one pound a year uh, consumption of high fructose corn syrup to over 50 in, uh, since 1970 to now. And CDC concludes that uh, by, if the current trends continue, that by 2050, one in three adults in the United States could have diabetes. Now imagine the United States with one third of our population with active type two diabetes. There's no amount of political rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic that can save us and save our health care system, if that's the case. And if you think about what kind of society we are becoming, in spite of the clear knowledge, in spite of the fact that the people are individually making decisions every day, what to smoke or not, what to eat or not, when you come back to climate change and you think about the same people making decisions about their high carbon lifestyle. And if you look at the carbon emissions per capita in the United States and how much higher they are than Europe and how many zillion times higher they are than places like India or China, the question is, will they change in the face of scientific data? That's my question. And maybe it'll be different this time, maybe. So what are we up against in terms of geo design? Well, a lot of people don't realize that when we talk about sea level rise, this is 120 meters. So that's, that's like you know, more than a football field um, uh, of rise has occurred in the last, since the last glacial maximum, so just the last, say, 20,000 years. And this little period of benign, stable climate during the last 8,000 years in which all of civilization happened, the river valleys formed, uh, the empires, the Assyrians, Romans, all the way up to today, happened in this very unusual period of um, benign climate. Now, if Antarctica were to melt, that would add another seven meters if Antarctica were to melt. And by the way, it would take centuries to perhaps thousands of years. If you look at the time, the slope here, this is not gonna happen during your lifetime. However, the atmosphere that we've filled up with CO2 is going to continue heating. And so what this is, is your current activities and our friends around the world's current activities are condemning our children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren. And since the CO2 stays in the atmosphere for thousands of years, a quarter of it will still be in the atmosphere 100,000 years from now. What we are doing now is determining the future of civilization for millennia. What's the data? Talk about global data. Well. During the 1800s and early 1900s, there was about six tenths of a millimeter per year in sea level rise. Then during the 60s, it went up to 1.8. Now it's about three. So in the last century, 
there was about two tenths of a meter rise. The best estimates right now, and these are depending on different economic scenarios, different amounts of reduction of carbon, more solar, less solar, nuclear, more nuclear, less nuclear. That's the IPCC uh, scenarios. But anyway, between one and two meters rise. So two meters would be 10 times the level of rise per century that we saw a century ago. And what about the future centuries? Here's a projection through 2300, up to five meters. And again, five meters assumes by 2300, Greenland hasn't melted, because that's seven meters. So I think this is fairly conservative. Well, when you can stop to think that 50% of the people on this planet live within 50 miles of the coast. What that means is that for the next few centuries, a vast amount of human capital and human time and effort will go into rebuilding the cities of the earth. Now, I don't know whether you feel optimistic or pessimistic at this point, but I've lived in this world and I've seen this. We knew everything that I just told you we basically knew 30 years ago okay, as scientists. And I, you know, I struggle to find hope. And in those three decades, the one thing that I've found, the one of all the hundreds of papers I've read and everything else, it was at the Metropolitan Museum of Modern Art and the exhibit called Rising Currents. How many of you have seen this exhibit? Okay. This is an extraordinary <laughs> activity. It took people just like you, people from architecture, people from art, people who were city planners, people who are, in Benjamin's term, engaged in geodesign. And it gave them five actual spots around New York, five real life neighborhoods and said, prepare this for a one to two meter rise in sea level by the end of this, by, I think it was actually 2080, and perhaps a 20 foot storm surge on top of that. And the creativity that went into here, the idea of artificial reefs made out of the surplus glass recycling, because there was a glass recycling thing there that they made into these sort of jacks and that was like, little kids' jacks you pick up, and they put them out there to, uh, you know, help uh, reduce the storm surges, uh, the use of oyster beds to um, take the toxicity out of the water, just on and on and on. One of the most imaginative examples of geodesign, of adapting as humans, as I said, have done for essentially the last million years to continual climate change. And so I think that this conference is really quite important in that regard because this is what we're going to be doing. This is what humanity will be engaged in. And so many of the things I heard yesterday were threads of the way we're going to rebuild the planet. And, and I think you've got a lot to add. I'll stop here. All of my talks are up on my portal. Um, I tweet them all. I tweet about a lot of things. Um, and you're happy and be free to download any of them. Thanks. <laughs>